Hey, a pleasant good day, everybody. This is the latest edition of the JB and Steel Shows. We're here to recap some blockbuster moves made around the NFL, Major League Baseball post-lockout, and even also the NHL getting some nice moves in before the deadline a little bit sooner than we would see in most years. But first and foremost, Steel, how are you doing on this fine uh, Wednesday morning as we recorded for our scheduling this week a little bit better? <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing famously, my man. How is the great JB doing, man? The great Joe Borick, the professor. Listen, if you guys aren't following this guy, you should be. He is the uh, beat writer for the Reading Royals. Uh, he also covers the Philadelphia Flyers and the uh, Phantoms for the Flyers Nitty Gritty. So you got to check him out for sure, for sure. I'm doing great, man. I can't wait to get into it. There is so much that's happened, especially with the NFL free agency uh, hitting uh, and then also the league year starting up here uh, at 4 o'clock Eastern time uh, today as we're recording this. Um, we also, just like you said, got some great um, pre-deadline uh, moves for the NHL. And then welcome back, baseball. The national pastime is back, and we're going to have baseball games here coming up real soon. So we're going to get a lot of that covered. So the first thing we're going to talk about— Preseason actually starts tomorrow. Tomorrow, yeah, there St. you go. Patrick's Day is the spring training start. Yeah, uh, there you go. So how about that? So I'll be at the Flyers game tomorrow, but you know that's a different story. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> see, yeah, you know, yeah. with Claude Giroux's 1,000th game and everything. Yeah, um, that's that's awesome. So we'll, only we'll reason to... I bought a ticket. Yeah, let's see. Um, so we're gonna get into the NFL. Uh, with the free agency uh, frenzy starting uh, this past Monday, uh, where a lot of teams made a lot of moves. And some of the moves that were made uh, by some of the teams, obviously the big moves that were announced um, much earlier uh, where the Russell Wilson deal, uh, where he was traded to the Denver Broncos, uh, and then also the re-signing of Aaron Rodgers, uh, the the big massive deal there, uh, the re-signing of Kirk Cousins as well uh, with the Vikings. So there's a lot of those. Wentz too, Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz being moved uh, to yeah. the Commanders. Uh, you know what I mean. So there's been a lot of moves made before even the free agency a day hit, uh, and so those deals all become, um, uh, you know, all the way good come four o'clock today. So. Free agency hit on Monday, and what do you think about some of the moves that were made throughout the NFL there, Joe? Uh, I like a lot of, of the moves that were made for certain individual teams. One move I didn't realize your Steelers made that I saw at the end of the uh, March 15th list that I must have just missed over is getting the guard from the Bears to a decent three-year deal. Daniels, who's only 24 and has seemed to be coming into his own in the last couple of years. Uh, so maybe he can continue to uptick and be one of your better linemen. That's a deal I actually really like for three years. I didn't even see that before I went to bed last night. So that's something that I think fits for your team that obviously needs more, not just guard help, but O-line help as, as in, in general. Uh, and that's probably why we'll get to this later. They got a quarterback that can move a little bit uh, rather than having Mason Rudolph as their starting uh, quarterback who can do exactly not that. Um, but Exactly. <laughs> When it comes to a defense, though, the Broncos also were able to replace Harris because they were able to bring in Randy Gregory, who decided to diss the Cowboys and uh, go, you know what? I like Denver better. Um, and then uh, almost had a deal done with the Cowboys, agreed to the same terms with the Broncos, and then decided to go to the Broncos, where that seems like a match made in heaven because they had to trade Harris to get Wilson. Now you have a guy that's probably better than Shelby Harris. Yeah, anyway, I think so, too. So, um, like that really worked out in the end uh, for them as well. And then one, even though I think Hassan Riddick is more in the B linebacker category of just good linebacker, not great at anything. I just liked the fact that the Eagles finally spent on a linebacker, which is a position for my entire life. They tend to not care about as much and just get the Alex Singletons of the world and the scrap heap guys that they try to turn into something, which Singleton did turn into something, but that doesn't happen often. Like then they like that's why they try to do that with the TJ Edwards. He didn't really turn into anything where yeah. Singleton at least did. So it's like that's fine. Riddick's been pretty good sacks the last few years. Like I didn't even realize he was that. I was like twelve point five and then eleven. So as a linebacker, that's really solid, which makes you think he's more of one of those D line linebacker switches. 
his issue is he's not always the most sharp in coverage where I think the Eagles do need a guy too. that. That's why I said this in my video, the Eagles shouldn't not draft a linebacker, which I don't think they did since I was born just because Hassan Riddick, they signed. Yeah. Hassan Riddick's not a linebacker. That's Landry who also got re-signed by the Titans, which is a good move. He's a guy that's just a very solid, does everything right. Linebacker. Howell Landry might be a, one of the best in the entire league. So there's just a different scale there. That's why if you picked up Landry, I would say you don't have to draft the linebacker. When you pick up Riddick, it's a nice, good pickup, but it's not somebody you should say, well, if there's a great linebacker here at one of our first round picks, we shouldn't pick it. But, yeah, I'm with you on that. I mean, some of the other like great defensive players that were moved was Khalil Mack. Um, it's yeah. like, it's like Chicago just said, yeah, we're just going to dump everybody or trade everybody or something. But Khalil Mack goes to, uh, the chargers and I'll tell you what, man, the chargers have made some very interesting moves so far. Okay. They, they signed, um, JC Jackson as well to a five-year deal. That was a really uh, s smart move for them as well. Um, Sebastian Joseph Day and then Austin Johnson as well, too, for them on defense. And then the, 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 the whole thing, too, with some of these other players that are still potentially available, and then some of the offensive players that have moved, like the Amari Cooper deal that sent Amari Cooper to Cleveland because they released – uh, uh, Landry Jones, Jarvis Landry, or Jarvis, Jarvis Landry. Landry. I'm sorry, Jarvis Landry. They released him outright, so I think somebody's going to pick him up somewhere. Mm -hmm. By by all stretch of the words, you know what I mean. It's just what what's. Well, I just think up. Jarvis Landry was. A be he worked better with Baker than Odell did, but not much. Right. Like both of those guys did good in spite of not working the best with the Baker Mayfield offense. Right. And then Landry did better in Cleveland statistically, in spite of not work, but. Then we saw what Odell could do away, helping until he got injured, unfortunately, in the game, but helping the Rams get to the promised land. And then Landry's a guy that if he goes in the right offensive setting for him, is going to do the same exact thing. On the, I for example, so. if he goes to the Chargers, the Chargers just added a bunch of defensive people. If they have Keenan Allen add in a guy like Jarvis Landry with the rest of the young cast, so they still have Williams there, I think. Yeah. So, like, you have some, you have those three then. Well, now you have a really formidable receiving core. You really added to your defense, which was an Achilles heel. So other than the D line. So you added a guy like JC Jackson, who's really going to help you. And you added another guy, like you said, to the D line and Sebastian Joseph day. So I think they're building their team up, right? And now it's just about making sure you protect Justin Herbert good enough to make him do what he needs to do and not run around and try to throw the ball 75 yards on his back foot. But I mean, and, and, and look, th them drafting him, Getting Herbert, I think, was a great thing. And now they have the opportunity right now because he's still on his rookie deal. Right. Yep. So it makes a lot more sense for them to go out and spend now while because let's face it, when when Herbert's come up for his deal, he's going to get paid. OK, because he's a good quarterback. He's done really well there in 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 a in a Charger uniform. And I think they will do anything that they can to keep him there uh, in a Charger uniform as well, too. You know what I mean? So um, another quarterback that went to was Carson Wentz. I mean, I wasn't yep. really expecting uh, the Colts to be moving uh, away from him so quickly and then him going to uh, the commanders. And, I mean, he's reunited now with the uh, with the East, and he's going to be facing Philadelphia now twice a year now. And, and, and you know, and well, what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, it's interesting. I think the commander's biggest mistake in that was taking the entire salary because then they had to dump Landon Collins because he wouldn't take a second pay cut. Right. But his exact quote was, they asked me to, I can't remember the exact thing, but it was the, the, the structure of it was, they asked me to take a first pay cut. I was fine with that. Once they asked me to take the second one because of Carson's salary, that's when I said, all right, I can do better in the free agent market. You all have a nice life. So yeah, right. like, that, that, that's why... He's gone. Landon Collins, compared to, like I said, with I said this in my video that I did on my channel, Russell Wilson trade. I would say the Broncos gave up a lesser defensive player to acquire Russell Wilson. Then Washington had to end up doing just because of taking on the entire salary of Carson Wentz. Yeah. Like Carson Wentz's entire that, that's a big risk to me because Wentz is one of those guys 
that some guys' stats are deceiving in a positive way. He's one of those guys lately the stats have been deceiving in a negative way, where if you look at his numbers, you're like, oh, my God, this guy's actually a pretty solid quarterback. But then if you actually watched any Colts games, if he was the guy that had to put it on his back, he couldn't do that anymore. That hasn't happened since 2017. And 2017 was, let's see, 18, 19. Great point, yeah. One, two, five years ago. So yeah. uh, you, you – no, like you, you have it. Sit. Now, granted, what one of that's because he's coming off. It was, it was an injury, and he had to come back from an injury. But at the same time, he's been removed from that injury for a decent bit now. Yeah. So he has to learn how to control kind of the pace of the game better with his inner clock, and that's when Wentz can be his best because Wentz tries to make too much out of nothing. Where there's a lot of times when you watch Colts games, even though he didn't throw a lot of picks he would end up throwing a ball that would be ill-advised that could have ended up getting picked right. up. Right, yeah, yeah. Where yeah. he should just take a sack or just gun it into the fifth row. Stand, like, right, like, yeah. don't <laughs> do something like, like don't don't just um, go nuts and almost fumble because you're kind of caught in the backfield trying to extend a play that's unextendable. Uh, yeah, no, I'm with you on that for sure. You know what I mean? And um, I'm, I'm going to be very interested to see how that's going to work out there uh, with him there uh, and and how things are going to fly as far as that's concerned. Um, I'm really the the um, one thing I want to talk about here real quick is the the amount of money that Jacksonville spent. <laughs> yeah. I mean, good gravy. And 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 that's a lot of money that they put out there. You know what I mean? And this team now has a new coach. And they're going to be, you know, they're, they're looking for all new things and, and things of that nature. Do you think with all this money that they've spent and getting the new coach, do you think Jacksonville is any better? I think they're better. I think it depends how good the new coach works for Trevor Lawrence. Okay. That's the biggest key to the Jacksonville Jaguar success. How quickly does the new coach get the most out of a guy that seems like talent wise? Is uberly talented, but it, and also I hate Urban Meyer. I'm just going to put that out there. So I don't care what his numbers were with Urban Meyer. I think Urban Meyer is a loser. Uh, but anyway, moving, tell us how you really feel about that, moving one, professor, that, professor Joe. Uh, like he might have winning record, but he's a loser of a personality in terms of the stuff he does off the field. Uh, but anyway, move, moving back to not trashing Urban Meyer, uh, I would think the Dolphins, the, their key to success is literally Jackson. Um, or not the Dolphins, Jacksonville's key to success is literally Trevor Lawrence and him being able to do what he can do and also have the openness to run the offense he was supposed to run. But with Urban, it looked like they were really restricted. Yeah. Where it was like, oh, you you want to do this? Well, actually, I don't want you to do that. Yeah. And where with Doug, Doug is in one of the more sometimes stupid aggressive head coaches in the NFL that I think that will help Trevor Lawrence, because Trevor Lawrence was kind of stupid aggressive sometimes in college. So okay. having two guys that kind of have that over aggressive mentality, they kind of would have to rein each other in, and that might work a decent bit. But I think Lawrence will be a pretty good jump from year one to year two I think so, as too. a quarterback, because I think he's a pretty talented quarterback. I also yeah. think this is depending on how the team does, though, because they keep fire selling people. But I don't think Justin Fields is going to be bad in year two either. It's just the Bears have to make sure they don't have a complete crap show around Justin Fields. That's the only thing. I'm with you. Uh, I, too, feel the same thing about Jacksonville. I think they went out and spent a lot of money because they did put a lot of investment into Trevor Lawrence. They they are banking on him being the face of the franchise for the next you know years to come or whatever the case is. And he is that kind of talent – in my opinion. And I also agree with you too, hundred percent where when you watch the Jacksonville games, man, he did look like he was hamstrung. Like he was completely held back. I get it. You don't want to let a rookie quarterback go out there and just, you know, be willy nilly, you know, putting himself in danger. Yeah, but look what the Bengals did though. The Bengals didn't care. And then Joe Burrow came back. I mean, he got injured, but then he came back and still took him to the Super Bowl. Okay. So, so we, we get that. We understand that, but what they have done though, so they put the franchise tag on Cam Robinson, an offensive tackle. They signed a three-year deal with Brandon Schrift, okay, to bring in protection. They re-signed um, Tyler Shatley, 
Okay, so they they brought guys in, and then they 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 spent a whole boatload of money on some targets for him. Uh, 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 Zay Jones, right, and and Christian Kirk spent a whole boatload of money on guys that he plus Evan Ingram to. Yeah. Also, Ingram's a very diamond in the rough guy because Evan Ingram's only concern is his health. As yeah. long as he can stay on the football field for you, he's a pretty good offensive weapon. For exactly, you. exactly. So they also brought in some uh, uh, the, that Fut- Futsakawa guy, whatever. Or how- oh yeah, I know who you're talking about the guy. I can never fully. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, the defensive <laughs> tackle, and then they also brought in uh, that Foy uh, Alaka- uh, Alokawan or whatever. Yeah, I know who you're talking about too. You right, linebacker. Right, so they brought in some defense because they definitely are lacking defense down there in Jacksonville. So they have. Whoa, we just went timber. <laughs> Joe took a little ride. That's all right. <laughs> but, but they have spent a good amount of money on some good, talented players to help protect Trevor Lawrence, to give him some weapons, and then to also give him some defense to work with, too. You know what I mean? Yeah, I agree with that. I think the Jaguars are poised to be a good team next year because, one, they have a head coach. Obviously, I like he won us a damn Super Bowl. I mean, you know, <laughs> and yeah. Then, yeah uh, and then they have a guy I think is going to be better poised with a guy that's a former quarterback that did well with Nick Foles in a run that nobody else has been able to, other than Chip Kelly, who I don't like, but we'll give him a shout out for that, uh, right. in the NFL. So. I mean, I think that that has some weight to it, too. I think Doug's one of those coaches when it comes to at least a quarterback, he tends to pull the most out of that position. Where with Wentz in the end, it was kind of just the personality. Everything wasn't clicking together, the locker room. I didn't really blame that on Doug. That was like eight extra circumstances that were not really Doug Peterson's fault. That I think was more Howie's fault, honestly, than anything else. But that's a different story for a completely different time. I think the I think the Jags are poised to be a good playoff contending team if they can have it all come together. Sometimes chemistry doesn't click with new players until week six or seven, and then that might make you have to recover too much this year, and then you would be a playoff team next year, and this would be your building year. Yeah. But we would have to see how quickly they can kind of get together and have that good gelling of a team as well. No, no, no. I'm, I'm with you on that, too, because just because you bring in a whole boatload of guys doesn't necessarily I mean, it doesn't matter how what talent level they are. I mean, we 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 saw a model like the Dallas Cowboys did in the 90s where they bought talent and, and it worked because they had a coach that could put them together. Right. You see what I'm saying? So, yeah, you can buy talent, but can you have a coach that can put them together, that can make them play as a team? And you need to have that chemistry. So just because you bring a whole bunch of these, you know, great, you know, players and all the other stuff, are they going to have chemistry? You know what I mean? Well, let's put it this way. If Doug can get the family vibes going with the Eagles he had in 2017 of camaraderie between everybody, then that'll be exactly what you need in Jacksonville. Uh, you know, I I really think they're going to be a much improved team the next two years. Okay, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because Trevor Lawrence is is on, this is only going to be his second year. Um, I still really think that he's just going to continue to um, escalate his play until I I think he's going to I think he could potentially be better than Mahomes. It depends. Yeah, I don't know. If, I mean, talent-wise, talent some of the comparisons wise. were there coming out of college. I think I have to give him a little bit of time. He could be maybe a miniature Mahomes talent. I don't know if anyone will ever get to the right. school level of right, everything right, right. Mahomes is able to do. You know? I'm with you. No, no, no. I'm with you. I agree. But I would, I would put him kind of in that same kind of circle where he could get to that level. Because yeah, I, over time. Yeah, I think it'll take a little bit longer than that. I agree. But I, I'm, I'm just trying to point out that I feel that Trevor Lawrence is a very talented quarterback, quarterback, and he'll be able to uh, be successful in any situation that he can be in as long as he's got, you know, weapons and everything else around him, just like everybody else needs to be successful. Um, yeah, I agree with that. One guy, other- though, I did want to um, just because he went to my high school, so I'll give him a shout out for getting a three-year deal from the Colts. The Colts did re-sign linebacker, special teams member Zaire Franklin for three years. Uh, so congratulations to Zaire for sticking around with Indianapolis. 
Uh, so I just figured I would throw that in there since he wasn't. Number yeah, one. man. That's awesome sauce, dude. You know, look, uh, m most of the people that I ever played with are now long since retired <laughs> and are not even close to getting putting a football uniform on anymore. So <laughs> the other one thing that we have to talk about, and I Garoppolo is still out there, still hasn't been adjusted or found or whatever's going to happen with him. We still don't know. Is he going to resign with San Francisco or is he going to be traded? Um, Tyler Murray is another one that I think is another maybe fluid situation here too, where I would like to see what's going to happen with him. Is he going to resign with Arizona? Because I know he's got two years left on his contract, but he's looking to get you know more deal. Also Baker, because Baker uh, after Deshaun visited. He sent a thank you message out, and it seems like he believes they're going to go a different direction. So, okay, so that was going to be my next thing I was going to say too is that Deshaun Watson is still out there as well too, and then that whole, you know, visiting um, Cleveland and kind of LeBron and, James esque uh, recruitment tour. Yeah, that's what somebody tweeted yesterday. I said it's a minor version of that because with LeBron there was a lot more hype because he's one of the best of all time with Deshaun right. very good quarterback. But. Right. No, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. So. Those are those are still very fluid um, things that are gonna that are gonna work themselves out here in the next coming weeks. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, the last thing I think we should probably talk about is the fact that uh, Tom Brady has come back out of retirement. Um, I think he was retired for twenty eight days or something. About a month at most. Yeah, right. <laughs> and uh, that didn't take long, did it? No, no, definitely not. I mean, I think uh, Tom Brady, I think he was one of the guys that when he retired, he was at the age. And that's why some people sort of go, well, maybe he will because he has the act. Well, not acting, but the directing. Uh, he's been in technically acting. He's been in Ted and stuff. But uh, he has other stuff away from football that he does with his agency and multitudes of different things. So he's kind of like LeBron, where like when he leaves, you don't think he would need the sport again because he does 856 other things. Right, 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 right. Where um, that's why he wanted to leave the Patriots, so he could have more freedom to do those things and be out of the Belichick culture. But not that he disliked the Belichick culture, just he doesn't give you as much freedom to do stuff away from the field. Where Brady, I think, coming back, it helps their odds. But like Gronk said... He, I don't even think he thinks they're a top AFC contender because I saw a report that said Gronk should go to a top AFC contender if he sticks around. And if so if he doesn't stay in Tampa, that's him even saying to one of his best friends, I don't think we're a top contender this year. I think we could be a contender, but we're not one of the premier Super Bowl contenders like we were two years ago. Yeah. So, like, that's what I th I don't think they, they moved up from, like, 20 to 1 to 10 to 1. That's fine, but I wouldn't put them any higher than that. Okay. I think there's still teams that are ahead of the Bucks because the Bucks lost stuff also. And running it back, they had noticeable age issues on that team last year where they weren't able to keep up with certain teams and all that yada yada. And injuries obviously hit them in the butt because when you get big time. That they're. I believe that they're going to be a team that uh, they just need to have him basically be the Tom Brady we've saw with the Patriots combined with the Bucks because I think this is a team that's a lot more skilled at positions than the Patriots ever were where Belichick would just build uh, yeah, oh, yeah. fit chemistry-wise. Yeah. But um, when it comes to that, I think they just need to be basically – just listen to Tom Brady. Let him. Don't let Bruce Arians get overly. Last year, I think Bruce Arians got too. And that basically screwed over the Patriots instead of just letting Tom be Tom. Yeah, no, I'm with you on that. Uh, and, and and that might, you know, that's the thing where you, you might have to find that balance. You know what I mean? And and now with them, with him coming back. You know, maybe they'll have more of those conversations or whatever. You know what I mean? And so it's I, I'm all I can say is that if he wants to keep playing and he's able to keep playing, then by all means, keep playing. OK, uh, 
And I also, though, have to agree, I don't think that the Tampa Bay team, even with him on the team, you're right. They're still not there. They're, they might be a contender, but they're not. I mean, you have to look at the other teams in the NFC long before you start looking at Tampa Bay. I mean, you'd have to put them in the conversation, but you would have to be looked at. Well, the reason they're also the in the conversation. And- yeah. The reason they're also in the conversation is the NFC doesn't really have quarterbacks that are elite anymore, per se, because all of them got traded to the AFC. Right. Where you have uh, Stafford, who just won the Super Bowl, who's kind of there. And then you have Brady, who's obviously elite. I would say Stafford's elite because he proved it with L.A., so we could put that in that category now. I would say, yes. Uh, So you have those guys, and then you have a bunch of up-and-coming quarterbacks that might eventually get there in the NFC. Yeah. But they're not there yet now that Russell Wilson's moved on from. So it, it's going to be interesting to see how the whole NFC plays out, where this might be the odd year that a team that like kind of has all this stuff formed around a quarterback's able to get farther in the NFC, like the Rex Grossman-esque years or the Trek Dilfer years of those guys going deeper than they should have as quarterbacks because the team around them is really good. Like there might be one of those years in the NFC just because there's not that many fantastic quarterbacks you're like well this guy's gonna win the final drive yeah other than tom brady and stafford and maybe another one or two guys no i'm with you on that i'm with you on that for sure a lot of stuff still going on in the nfl right now the league year starts uh today the 16th of march uh at 4 p.m eastern time is when the actual league year starts so that's when all of these moves deals and everything officially become official uh, you know, so <laughs> did you want to talk about the uh, Trubisky move before we moved on from the NFL? Or <laughs> well, uh, I did a, I did a separate show about Trubisky uh, moving to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Um, the fact that the Steelers re-signed uh, a bunch of their um, current players. Uh, as far as like their offensive line, they brought in the the James Daniels move. That I thought that was a good move, um, bringing in um, an, a young up and coming uh, offensive player uh, that um, knows Trubisky, that has played with him. You know what I mean, and can be somebody that he can look on the offense and go, "Oh, hey, I know that guy." Oh, hey, I played with this guy. Or, hey, I know, you know, and 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 vice versa. You know what I mean? Um, the fact that they uh, re-signed uh, a core four uh, uh, as well. Um, I, I, I believe there's also going to be a center that's going to be signed um, to Pittsburgh. So there's some other fluid things going on. Killebrew re-signed, um, Arthur Mullet re-signed, and, and Robert Spillane re-signed. So those are pretty good re-signings for Pittsburgh. Those are depth guys that are going to be needed down, down the stretch and everything like that too. So Pittsburgh still has some offensive needs. Um, Juju Smith-Schuster is still out there. I would like to see him back as a Steeler. I think that would do them much better because James Washington has outright asked for a trade. Um, So he's probably not going to be back with Pittsburgh this coming season. So that only leaves um, Chase Claypool and, and uh, gosh, I'm blanking on his name. Um, Chase, Chase Claypool and, and, and uh, McLeod, Ray Ray McLeod. Oh, okay. McLeod. Right. Uh, you he really know. should be like a fourth receiver on your depth chart or right. third at best, yeah. Right, right. And Johnson, too, you know what I mean? So that's only three guys, and then we have a tight end. So we still need that other type, you know, wide receiver that we need to put in there with that mix. You know what I mean? And I would like to see uh, Juju back in, in as a Steeler uniform. I don't know if that's going to happen, but, you know, uh, I'm not – I'm I'm a, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna be a wait and see on Trubisky. I'm I was not very enthusiastic about this move for the Pittsburgh Steelers because I I really felt that he does have some upside, but is it gonna be enough upside to win the job? And is if it's gonna be enough upside to win the job, is he gonna be able to keep the job? Because if you start going back and forth between him and Mason, like they did the year two years ago with between Mason and Duck, that to me is not a successful way to win games. Yeah. Now I do think Mitchell Trubinsky is significantly superior to Duck. Oh, Duck yeah. Hodges was literally yeah. just a 
was yeah. literally just a running back at the quarterback. Like, like he was pretty much a guy that could pass five to ten yards max, and then would just run, run the run the ball. So I do think Mitchell Trubinsky definitely has more overcompassing talent than Duck Hodges. That's why yeah. it's an interesting move to me because they were able to go eight and eight in that season with a guy that really couldn't pass and one guy that couldn't move if the line was struggling. So it wasn't the best combination where with Trubisky, he can move. He's not the best passer, but in year one, when they ran and let him run, let the running back control and open up the field with the Bears, he had his best talent. And obviously the Steelers offense is predicated on the run, first and foremost, with Najee Harris. And then you have, once, especially now, it probably will be now that you have the linemen too. And then you're going to open up the field that way. Trubisky running those option plays will open up the field. And that's the right way to run the offense. And I would think that's probably how they're going to do it yeah. because that would just make the most sense. Yeah, because Matt Canada's offense is predicated on a lot of the RPOs and a lot of the jet motions and a lot of the jet sweeps and a lot of the misdirections. And let's face it, Ben was not that guy. And Mason Rudolph is especially not that guy. Yeah, especially at 38. Yeah. Well, right, but even Mason Rudolph <laughs> is not that guy. You know, no, you need a guy that is mobile enough that can roll out and make those quick decisions by either doing the RPOs or you know, <clears throat> tucking it in and running or, or backing up and throwing. Those are the kinds of things. That's the way offenses are going these days. That's how things are, are geared these days. That's the kind of Matt Canada offense that when you open up his full book of offense, that's what that's what his thing is. So well, I also think Trubitsky, as my closing point in the NFL, got a chance because he but he had a very mature re, um, take on his career and said, I have to be a backup to somebody that's really good. Learn from him, grow from him. He was obviously in Buffalo. So he got and got to play a little bit there when Allen was subbed out. And uh, he got to learn behind one of the best in the game. That also is a guy that obviously slides out of the pocket and does different things himself and doesn't stay just stationary, throws those right. odd platform exactly. throws. Yep. So he's a perfect guy for Mitch to learn from. I think that's why he got an opportunity because he got to mat- he had a mature take and went somewhere to be able to grow himself football mindset wise, but also yeah. skill wise. Yeah. And that's why I think he's got this opportunity. I don't think yeah. he would have got this opportunity if he went to be a platoon player somewhere. Like yeah, you were saying, you. they did with Duck and they did with Mason. Yeah. Well, going to be interesting. It's going to be wait and see. So we'll see how yeah. it goes. Um, the last that. move I will say uh, that I do like just from the sense of giving this guy a chance. I always thought he kind of got slighted in terms of having opportunities since his time in Buffalo. I do like the Giants. I don't like the Giants as a team, but I like the Giants. Gave Tyrod Taylor a chance yeah. uh, for two years because I thought Tyrod was kind of, to me, he's in that Jimmy Garoppolo game manager style quarterbacks, but for some reason, Jimmy Garoppolo gets 865 opportunities. And then, well, I understand Jimmy Garoppolo has won more games, but he also has won more games because he's not with the Bills and not with, he's with teams that have a much better chemistry and much better game plan and, and been to a Super around. Bowl too. And, yeah, and, and a bit to a Super Bowl, yeah, and have one of the best head coaches. So, like, the, those things kind of play into you being in a better spot. So yeah. I, I do like how the Giants did give him a chance. It's going to be interesting to see what he can do. And obviously him, if they decided, I don't know if they're drafting quick, but now they have Tyrod and Danny, he might be a good guy too to come in and calm down Daniel Jones if they decide to keep having him go. And then maybe next year Tyrod can slot back into the backup. Daniel Jones can give it another shot again. And you'll see what happens there. Or they let him play for two years and then they give it back if, if the Tyler Tyrod mentors Jones well too, I think. He's a good guy to have for a struggling quarterback also. I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that. So a lot of stuff going, moving and shaking here in the NFL and a lot of stuff still happening and and a lot of things still up in the air. There's still a lot of free agents out there left and there's still a lot of deals that need to be made. There's, there's guys that have been assigned the franchise tag and those kinds of things. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the NFL right now, especially since the league uh, has opened up. But um, I want to touch briefly, just briefly on something that's going to be coming up here uh, on Monday, the 21st of March, and that is the NHL uh, free agency um, is is going to hit on... Trade deadline. Trade, oh, deadline. trade deadline, I'm sorry. Trade deadline is going to hit on, on Monday, the 21st, and we've already seen some moves, haven't we, Joe? Yeah, yeah, the one... 
Uh, the Ducks, too, they really technically, if you want to look at it in this scheme, got two second-round picks for Josh Manchin because Drew Hellison was just recently a second-round pick that then yep. played really good. I thought he was one of the most impressive guys in three games with the USA. The Colorado think. deal. Yeah, and he got sent over there. Then they immediately signed him to his ELC. So now they have a very good puck-moving defenseman. I said this in my video yesterday. This is this is I don't like comparing guys to these mega super guys. That's why I said if they, it's like if the Flyers let Travis Sanheim beat Travis Sanheim five years ago and not just this year, uh, all of a sudden they realize, oh, we should let this guy be the player he was in juniors. No right. kidding. Uh, like, but um, he's a guy that moves the puck up the ice. A very good passer is solid in his own zone. That's why I would compare him more to. Sandheim, because if they let Sandheim develop his offense first and then develop his own zone, I think he would be even better than he is now. Now, but the Flyers are not very good at developing, uh, unlike Colorado and unlike and unlike uh, the uh, Ducks too, because the Ducks are actually one of the better teams with defensemen. If you look at their team over the course, like you would look at players coming up on defense, they have that Ben Walk kid who's been pretty impressive now oh this gosh, year. Yeah, they're a pretty good team when it comes to defense, just kind yes. of putting them in the right position. And then they got um, Axel also in the minors. So, I mean, you've got to have other guys, Axel Anderson, to, to be able to come up as well. I think they're setting them up for great self, up for great success in the future. And th that was a great move for them because they seem like they're going to commit to keeping Lindholm around. They didn't have money to keep both. So they're going to keep Hoppus. They got in a great guy like Drew Hellison, where his ceiling, like I, this is the thing I said in the video, his ceiling, but I don't like putting guys in this comparison because his pressure is probably Latang. But that's a high bar. So that's why I said, like, Sanheim, guys that jump up on the play really well, but need to still learn how to be more 100% great in their own end are kind of what Hellison is. But if he can put it all together, he is a great passer. He doesn't have the same shooting mentality of Chris Latang, but passing-wise, getting it up the ice, being that power play playmaker, he has some stuff that reminds you of his game. No, I'm with you on that one for sure. Uh, I'm with you on that one for sure. And – Colorado has, um, you know, they also pulled the trigger here too, and 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 made the move uh, with uh, another player, sending them to Anaheim. Uh, you know what I mean? And and that was one of the players that I think that um, Philadelphia was looking at to get for the Giroux trade. And that oh, was sending the, him to uh, the Wild. You mean? Yeah, he yeah. was traded to the Wild by Avalanche for Strom and. On the show that I did last night with Jim Jackson and I, Isaiah from OMB Puck, we talked about a couple of players from Colorado that would be good matches for the Giroux trade. Because, look, let's face it, this coming uh, trade deadline here on the 21st of March is all going to be about the Giroux show. Uh, I mean, yeah, let's face thing. it, he's the top talent that's out there, really, that is— Him and then potentially Max Stop. Patrick Matt Kane's a former pitcher in baseball. Patrick Kane uh, right. has been rumored out there. It's just can that be an in-season trade with the captain of Patrick Kane? Exactly, exactly. Or, you know, yeah. so he's going to be the star of the show come the twenty-first, and in all likelihood, it does look like the Flyers will be moving on from Claude Giroux um, to try to get at least some assets back from him uh, for him, but. With now Yost gone and Hellison gone, okay, there's another maybe one or two other players that I can think of on the team on Colorado right now that might potentially still be there for Giroux, for the Giroux trade. Because Colorado does not – and now they don't even have a second-round pick in next year's draft. They traded that away, right? earlier so they don't even have a second round pick in 2023 i think what your reef said about colorado your best bet for colorado at this point is going to them and saying you're contending for the you're trying to win the cup right your goal is to win the stanley cup this year alex newhook's great and is going to be great but he's 21 do you really think he's ready to be that cup winning forward yet Give us a one for one. Give us New Hook. We'll give you Claude Giroux. You get the old guy. We get the young guy. And then just basically call it a watch, call it a day. New Hook's not going to be the same exact level icon of Giroux, but he's going to be a great player in this league that's very good on both ends and has already been producing at a, uh, what is it, point four or five points per game pace in yep. his rookie season yep. on a team that on other teams he probably would have got more opportunities just because Colorado's loaded. 
So yeah. um, I think uh, he's a guy that you can kind of do that one for one if you want to do that. The only other way you could go, Coffer's been in trade rumors. So I guess if you want to go Justin Barron and JT Comfort, you could get a defenseman at center, and that would still give you the defense center like you would have got in some of the uh, Joe yeah, okay. uh, rumors. I'm glad you brought those two guys up because those are exactly who I was going to talk about too was uh, Confer and Baron. Um, I think that Colorado is going to need to put that in the bucket too for Giroux because I just do. I just feel that there's going to – I I think that that was a great idea, um, new hook for Giroux, but I, I just don't see that being enough. Okay, I just don't see that being enough, and and that. Well, I just, think my thing is new hook. I think is better than Comper and or Barrett. Like what new I hook agree. is going to be as a whole. Where I, that's why I think what your reef said got me thinking. Didn't we? There's no point in getting two decent people for a star if you can get one guy that's probably going to be also an all star for years to come for a guy that was elite. Because you're never going to get elite for elite. Exactly. That just doesn't exactly. Oh yeah, no, no, no. But never new hook that probably has time. the yeah. New Hook probably has the best chance to be an impending all-star for years to come, where Barron is going to be a very good defenseman. He's going to be an all-star level defenseman. That remains to be seen. And JT Comfort is a very solid player on both ends, but is he going to be able to get the offense to uptick more? That's something that remains to be seen, where New Hook already has the offense uptick more than JT Comfort in even his rookie season. So it's not- Okay, but That's- if you bring in Comfort and you bring in – or you bring in Newhook and you bring in one of those defensemen and a draft pick from 2023 or whatever, okay, um, then that only bolsters our defense who is – do we or do we not need help on defense for the Flyers? We could use help on defense. I also agree with Isaiah of what he said on um, – what it'll come out today, the uh, Getting Gritty With It podcast, which is the Flyers haven't been playing the right people with their defense. You should have been calling up guys months ago to give yep. them opportunities yep. because now you're in a lose-lose situation. You yep. put York in finally again, and you finally put him with someone that makes sense to play him with, yep. uh, but not necessarily fully because he's still on his offside. But Proby's a better defenseman to play with than Keith Yandel, who can't move at this point of his career. Uh, and then for Yandel, you should have Zamula in because this is the thing with Yandel. They probably promised him they would not bench him. I think that's what happened. We talked about that on the show. They probably made a promise at the beginning of the season. We're not going to destroy your streak. Not thinking, and we brought this up on the show. I forget if it was Isaiah, or, but I or forget if it was Vasily. But they probably did not think he was going to suck this much when they made that promise that you could stay in the lineup no matter what. Because you're because with Florida last year, even when he was starting to have a phone out with them, he was still, if you talk to the players, a good Productive. leader in the locker room, a guy yeah. that, yeah, and he was still able to do things where this year, Not so much, where that's why he, to me, should still be subbed out for one. Nick Sealer and Cam York playing together made more sense structurally. It's not like Nick Sealer is the sexiest name out there, but he's filled in well as a 6'7 defenseman, more so than the Kanadans and Yandel's been able to do. Yandel's just in there for name brand at this point. My thing with the Flyers is you should have Wiley up at some point. You should have Zamula up at some point. And another guy that's even been pretty solid in his minor league career early on, he's not ready to be fully in the NHL yet, but he might as well give a cup of coffee to his Linus Hogberg from Sweden. So, like, there's different guys in the minor that already should be getting looks that you see other teams. And I said this to uh, Yarif in a much more emphatic fashion um, that you can check out on that show if you if you want to check it out. But when you have the Arizona Coyotes, who are, by the way, going to be playing in a 3,500-person stadium next year, uh, yeah, right. Having a better mindset of positions to put people in with Tourney and knowing how to put guys like Moser, guys like uh, Dyson Mayo, guys like uh, Vladislav Kayonchuk and Kyle Bianco in the right spots to succeed speaks volumes to how much the Flyers are failing right now as an organization. Because you have a team that's considered the biggest basically crap show to say it in nicer terms in the NHL and their coach still is a guy that I think is basically Jeff Blaschel. Tony to me is like a Jeff Blaschel. If you, if you commit to him and keep him around for the whole rebuild retool, you're going to have the right system. You're going to have the right mindset 
And now you're just going to have to get the right people in order to make that system be the best effect it can be. And I think that's what Tourney is starting to form with them, which is why I think we need a coach that doesn't have as much like, – like he's an older guy but still doesn't have as much NHL – coaching because i don't know if he had any before this so he's a guy that yeah that still came in and got to be fresh got to have all that new enthusiasm of being a book i think we need a coach like that that can kind of build it up over time like the black shows like it seems tourney's doing and just bring the right mindset the right system the right culture and then you start winning over time like we see arizona's catching us we might be below arizona by the end of the season because they started winning lately I'm with you on that, man. I'm with you on that 100%. And I, we talked about the third pairing uh, on the show um, that, that I did with uh, Jim Jackson and uh, Isaiah from OMB Podcast. We talked about the third pairing being the, the, the worst part of Philadelphia for this year so far. But a lot of things happening in the NHL that we're not really aware of yet because the you know the trade deadline's coming up. One thing I do want to mention here real quickly is the fact that we finally got the Alex Ovechkin uh, goal finally happened last evening, and and Ovechkin passes Yager for third with seven hundred. Yeah, and then Yager, and then Yager messages. He's like, "Well, you know, I might still come back. Don't don't get too comfortable with." Uh, <laughs> Because the guy's still playing. He's 50 years old. I haven't, old, I haven't retired playing. yet. Yeah, you know. so that was a pretty funny message. But Right. I'm I you. mean, realistically, I do think a rebuilding team would honestly – like he. but but he said that, I think, is a joke because he also said – he was on another podcast I listened to. I can't remember which one it was, but this was a couple months ago. And he was on there and said the NHL game is different nowadays. I don't think I would enjoy playing as much in today's league as I did when I played. And he was even a more skilled guy, but he said, I liked being able to have that physical bruteness to my game on top of skill that you can't get away with as much. Uh, in as, today's. Especially as a skilled uh, forward, uh, you yeah. know, the, 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 that's kind of the, you know, that, like that for example, uh, Nathan McKinnon, the reason people react poorly uh, to Nathan McKinnon, uh, RA, the guy on a, uh, the guy that mentors Biz and Wit on spinning checklists, the guy in the middle, uh, he he said this, is because not many players are like that anymore. If this was 20 years ago where you had a star that was also a pest and a pain in the butt that would piss off the other team, do stupid stuff like Tom Wilson does every now and again, that would have been common because back then you had a lot of stars like Eric Lindros. For example. You had a lot of guys that would do a- a- everything and, and, and piss off the other team <laughs> that, that – <laughs> that you don't have that as much nowadays and everybody sometimes looks at McKinnon sideways, but to me, it's just he's more old school where the new school fans don't realize that's really – he probably grew up watching some of the guys that did exactly that. Exactly, exactly, exactly. You know what I mean? And so that's the thing where, uh, you know, it's like, man, uh, it – a lot of stuff is going on, and it's it's going to be very interesting to see how things pan out. You know what I mean? And with the the trade deadline coming uh, up here uh, on Monday, and some of the moves that Colorado's already made, um, I'm going to be very interested to see how the Claude Giroux show is going to go. You know what I mean? And where he's going to go, and if he goes. Okay, and that's what I think is going to be the biggest thing. Congratulations to Ovechkin uh, for 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 breaking the the record there finally. And I'm glad that's over because now we don't have to talk about that anymore. And now that pressure has been lifted off of him, right? You know, so he doesn't have to worry about that anymore. Um, but the next thing I think we should talk about is the fact that oh my gosh, folks, we got baseball back. Yeah, we got baseball back, and we have ridiculous – on top of signings, there's been ridiculous trades, of which one happened today that I'm just seeing on my uh, ticker here. Uh, Matt Chapman got traded to the Blue Jays, the A's all-star third baseman, for prospect, infield prospect Kevin Smith, pitching prospect Gunnar Hoagland, relief pitcher Kirby Sneed, and Zach Lowe, who's a very good wow. pitching prospect. So the Blue Jays continue to get richer. Um, as now they add him, uh, 
And th- that's a great addition to me because the Blue Jays, their lineup is fantastic. You have obviously Flag Guerrero who can pinch hit, uh, or not pinch hit, can DH or play first base, I should say. Um, you obviously have Lourdes Goriel, Teoscar Hernandez becomes an afterthought in the lineup when Teoscar Hernandez in most people's lineups would be one of your main thoughts. Uh, so I, I think their team is put together like an absolute juggernaut. And plus, they were able to also add the pitching. They obviously have Jose uh, Barrios. They got Manoa. They got Richards. They got good young pitching. Uh, Hung So Kim. Um, and I, I think they're really um, just putting it together out there. And it's all about, basically, for them, it's just all about if they can have, you've seen great teams of great talent put together, like we said, when it came to football, it's if they can have the right team feel around it, where the Marlins many years ago, I want to say it was like the 2011, like, I think I want to say it was 2011, 2012, they spent a lot to get the Hanley, they had Hanley, they got Jose Reyes, they got all the, it didn't work, because the, the, the personalities did not mess. Yeah. So with the Blue Jays, I do think they're getting people that seem to be more of those great team guys. Like Chapman's always been known to be whatever you ask him to do, wherever you ask him to hit in the lineup. Uh, he's not going to moan about it. He's just going to go, okay, cool. I do extra. I do this. There's no, there's no issue there. I do that. And they also picked up um, one of the more solid uh, guys in Andrew Vasquez as well to a one-year deal, 800K, who's a relief pitcher that's been a stud in the minors but hasn't necessarily been able to fully uh, hone it in yet in the majors. And uh, that's a guy that I've always really liked from that aspect. So it'll be interesting to see what he can do. And then obviously they also added Yusei Kikuchi uh, in the pitching rotation who really helps them because Kikuchi probably got overpaid a little bit because he's more of a 3-4. But when you're the Blue Jays, uh, you might as well pay a guy $36 million to be your four starter to just help fill out your team when it looks like on paper you're one of the top contenders. Right. And and they're looking for like Vladimir Guerrero Jr. and and Bo Bichette to, to break out and have monster years this year too. And and we talked about the Blue Jays before in some of our earlier shows too, where they had quite a lot of potential uh, moves that they could make and they are making those moves. You know, and yeah. they're bringing those guys, and they're bringing those players in here. And right now, they're the favorites in in the American League. They've kind of been the uh, Jags of the not spending as much money, but in terms of aggressiveness, yeah, they've kind of been the Jaguars of the um, baseball because they're going to have to re-sign Chapman too. So they're probably going to do kind of what the Yankees did, or not the Yankees, excuse me, the Braves did when they traded for Matt Olson, yeah. which is then give him a eight year contract and that has a bunch of money attached to it. So they know they're going to have to commit to to um, Chapman as well, where the two Matt duo is now going from Oakland uh, and they're on two different teams. Uh, Olsen is now with the Braves and gets to build his stuff up there where the Braves decided to go younger. Freeman's going into his age 33 season. Olsen's going into his age 28. So they right. decided to shed a couple of years off there after Freeman won the World Series. Whether you think that's the right decision or not is a completely different task. But Matt Olson is a very good first baseman. That's a good yeah, platinum yeah, yeah, yeah. gold glove level. So you, it, it is what it is. Now we're seeing where Freddie Freeman is going to end up landing. Bryce Harper did have an interesting quote where he said, well, after how they handled that, something like this, like after how they handled him in the end, why wouldn't he want to play Atlanta 17 times a year? Which was basically Bryce saying, hey, Freddie, come here. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. right. So, yeah. like that. That was price in recruitment talk. Yeah. But I mean, the Yankees signed um, Anthony Rizzo um, to a deal. Yes. So that, that probably takes them out of the Freeman market. No, right? I don't see them. Also, John Heyman reported they were never really in it. Okay. They said right. Freeman, like they, like Freeman met with them and they to- could tell early on he didn't want to play with the Yankees. Okay. okay. Like he would uh, rather play somewhere else somewhere in the else. interview. Yeah, yeah. Okay. He kind of just did it to be white and be yeah. a guy that didn't turn somebody down for an interview, but he never really, it seemed like wanted to play in New York. But when okay. it comes to other trades though, just while we got this, this one I like shout out to because the guy's a local area pitcher that was successful right over the bridge in Canada. But uh, the twins um, were able to get Sonny Gray um, 
and Francis Pogrero, who's a good location specialist in the minor. Rare to have a guy that's that young be a guy that's really dotting his own. So if he can continue to develop, that's nice. And they traded a top pitching prospect, Chase Petty, who's actually from New Jersey and had nice. a lot of success in his local area. So it'll be interesting to see what Petty's able to do as he develops into a pretty good frontline starter with the Reds and the Red and the Twins now get a good veteran pitcher um, for him as well. Where the Twins also they were able to acquire the Twins were a very strategic team. So they were able to acquire Isaiah Connor for life uh, in the Mitch Garver trade, and then they flipped Isaiah Connor for life uh, with Josh Donaldson and Ben Wortvet for Gary Sanchez and Gio Urshela. So the Twins are doing like trades that you almost do at MLB the show, where it's like, let me grab this guy and then immediately trade this guy for this guy. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but like, like, those aren't even usually trades that happen in real life. Those are right. usually trades you see more in a video game. So that 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 was kind of that was kind of interesting to see that actually happen in real life. A yeah. guy get picked up just to get moved for something else they had in mind, because that doesn't happen over the world. I'm with you, man. I'm with you. So now, let me ask you this question: What was it that broke the that broke the lockout? I mean. We talked about it. We've touched on it. You know what I mean. And it, it, we, we both had our opinions of, you know, we felt that certain things needed to be made. So what was it that broke the lockout? What was it that brought everybody to the table and said, okay, yeah, we can go forward? I think honestly, in the end, it was just a publicity. Once they realized, like, I don't think players and owners wanted to be called some of the things. And now this time around with social media, it was more the owners were getting belittled more so when you looked at polls than it was the players where in the past lockout social media wasn't as prevalent obviously at all uh but in sports lockouts i mean it was at least prevalent with the nfl and nhl but baseball they haven't had one since the 90s so it wasn't prevalent at all right so i think it kind of changed the tide but they started going look guys we got to get this done there's people saying this is the beginning of the end we can't have that like so I think it was really just a pressure in the end. And the players also eventually said, well, you know what, here, we're compromised with you. We'll decide the international draft by July. If we decide against it, because we don't think the logistics will work well for the DR and those Spanish countries can't get set up quickly enough, so it won't be fair to them. So if we decide against it, we'll keep the qualifying offers attached to free agents and the uh, international pool will stay the same going forward. If we decide for it, we'll implement the international draft. We'll have six to 17 blocks that switch each year. So each year, so say you're in the top seven one year, if it's 17, you'll be in the next seven. The bottom seven will be the top seven picks. And they're kind of rotated that way so everybody gets a good chance of international prospects rather than based off a record. But that'll be interesting to see if they decide into that because I think that, as a fan perspective, sounds like a cool idea. But then I read a lot of articles where Ortiz, Tatis, they came out and said the logistics don't work and they know obviously those countries really well. So when then they come out and say from guys that declare themselves, Soto said the same thing. He was one of the last guys to declare in his class and he might be the next Tony Gwynn. So like you, you, you have certain logistic things there that don't always work. That's why I think if it can work, it's a great thing that could be good for the fans if the MLB could also make it a big event, which they haven't made the MLB draft really yet. So they would have to also make it a big event and a mecca event for that to be the case. Yeah, but I think that's a good thing. But I think them offering them that bone is what got them the better um, pre-arbitration pool so they can get extra money to players, which is what they wanted, and got them the better um, average annual salary hike because they okay. said, we'll give you the bone of we'll decide by July, and if we don't, you guys can just put everything back to normal and still make extra money on qualifying offers, like 50 to 100 million a year, and and then um, do that, and you still have that option. If we agree to the international draft, then you don't have that option because now you have something you really want, which is an international draft. So. Right, exactly. You know what I mean? So I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm with you on that, and I'm glad to see – uh, that um, they, they were finally able to, to get things worked out. And, and now that we have baseball, you know what I mean? So that's all I really cared about was the fact that, you know, can they get things worked out? Can they make it so that, you know, we get to have baseball? Um, that's all I really cared about. You know what I mean? And the, 
there's I, I I understand as far as like with the 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 whole um, making sure that the, the these guys get the money, you know what I mean, and and that's the the hard part about all this. Do you know what I'm saying? And and making sure that these guys get money and paid. Uh, look, we're not talking about the guys that are making three hundred and fifty million dollars. We're talking about the guys that are you know making barely you know below. You guys know, that come up from the miners. Yeah, that pay that are, nothing, that are, and then have to wait all these years to get paid something. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. So I'm I'm just glad that baseball was able to um, take care of their business. And and do the right thing here and get baseball back to where it should be, and that's um, guys playing. Yeah. Okay. Well, for people that don't know, uh, baseball, the reason players want to have that pre or pool and get more money is they get paid by far the least of any minor league. Where even compared to the ECHL, a decent amount of ECHL players make more than MILB players. Where AHL is way more. Practice squad is significantly more, and G League is significantly more money. Right. Where even ECHL was like 10K more for some of those guys. Where with baseball, that's why it was so backwards, because you have a league that it, it doesn't have a hard cap. It has an artificial salary cap with the luxury tax, with the CBT thresholds for the luxury tax, yet you're the league that hurts your minor leaguers the most. Like that, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And that's why they had to, because they can't fix, at least right now, the root pay issues in the minor league. They had to make it so you got paid more once you got up to the bigs and had that pool if you did really well. And you also had, if you were like in a certain voting block, you would have a year of service time and all that stuff now, too, even if you came up later to help you with your contract negotiations right. and stuff. Right. They had all that stuff coming to fruition because these guys don't get paid. It, it, I looked it up. It's like 8K to 14 something where, right, where for the U S poverty line in most settings, it's about 12, eight. So like minor league players tend to work. And I've listened to multiple podcasts with them on it. They say they work different, a bunch of different jobs in the off season. They do. So like most of them where otherwise they're either, or they're like, whether it's just working for a media company and making money that way, or talking about baseball the whole season, or it's them doing a other job, they tend to work something else in the off season to make a lot of their money. They don't make a lot of their yeah. money from playing minor league baseball. Yeah, exactly, exactly. You know, and and if you're if you're trying to play minor league baseball and trying to make it into the bigs, you need to be playing baseball all the time and not be worrying about, you know working another job so you can pay the rent or you, you, you I mean look playing a sport is a full-time job okay no matter how you slice it there's no off season okay there really isn't because if you sit around for two three months and then you suddenly you know have to go back and play now you're gonna have to take a whole bunch of time to get back into shape so so athletes today stay in shape the whole year round. There's really no off season. They might take a couple weeks off here and there, you know what I mean? But there's really no off season anymore. You know what I mean? So I'm, like I said, I'm just glad to see that they were able to work things out and get things rolling so that now we can have baseball back. And that's really all that's important. There's been a lot of moves that have been made and a lot of things that are moving and shaking right now for baseball. Um, the trade deadline for the NHL is coming up here on the 21st uh, of March. That's this coming Monday. Uh, I imagine, uh, Joe, we'll probably have a real special show for that night, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Monday, yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, what comes in by the time we end up doing a show that night for the NHL trade deadline, what comes to fruition and what doesn't come to fruition. Right. Hopefully it's a pretty exciting deadline, that's for sure. And then baseball, there's still going to be a lot of stuff coming in. Like, for example, my Phillies today did give Kyle Schwarber. Who's yeah, I saw that. Yeah, I saw that. Contract. Um, so, and they also signed Brad Hand. Yep. Uh, so I think uh, that was a good pickup. And then my boy, Andrew McCutcheon, who I will love to to the death to the end, signed with the Brewers. So congratulations to Kutch for going to the Milwaukee Brewers. Right, right, right. I also thought we should have had interest in keeping him, but that's a story for a different time. Uh, I, I think this year we've actually been almost, because of the way the lockout have, if you're a really fanatic sports fan, blessed with 
almost has been a blessing in disguise because now you have all these moves in every sport happening at the like no kidding like like uh, you know the the the, the baseball uh, is back and 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 the NHL is going because the uh, trade deadline already passed so they already made all the moves warranted in the NBA but in other sports like the NHL, the MLB, and the NFL, all this stuff is literally happening at the same time. And if yeah. you're three of those leagues, it's a very exciting time. I agree. And 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 what a great time to be an analyst. What a great time to be in in, in this broadcasting industry because it's like when when some of the restrictions were lifted and we got hockey, football, and basketball back in the fall last year. Right. Like that all kind of came back at one shot. You know what I mean? And so now we're kind of more and more of the restrictions are being lifted. And so now more and more um, things are being allowed and stuff like that, too. So, um, man, I'll tell you what, Joe, I, I think we got a really good one here today. What do you think? Yeah. And speaking of restrictions, I forgot to mention that when it comes to baseball, unvaccinated players for the Yankees and Mets cannot play in New York. Oh, they they similar to Kyrie Irving. With that mandate, it's the same for baseball until Eric Adams. Yeah, Eric Adams uh, changes the mandate. Okay, okay. Well, there you go. I mean, still still some things being mandated, but I know that the NFL has lifted theirs. And I know <laughs> I'm, I'm imagining that probably by the time the playoffs come, I'm hoping that the NHL follows suit with lifting the restrictions on everything because right now um, the NHL still has certain restrictions in place um, for COVID protocols and things of that nature. Uh, you know what I mean? Um, but I'm just hoping that some of those things can go away um, as more time goes along and things of that nature. So too. Um, thank you very much, Joe, for a great show, man. Yep. Thanks for hopping on steel. It's been awesome. It's been awesome to talk about all the news around the MLB NFL and, uh, NHL and then going forward in coming weeks, you had too much to include it, but it's coming into the uh, tail end. We're mixing some NBA talk too coming into the tail end. There was just way too exactly. much. Exactly. To, well, we will shout out that Carl Anthony Towns and Kyrie Irving were the first people, I think it was just the 60s, to have back to back 50 point games on back to back nights, to have two guys, two different guys score 50 points on back to back wow. nights. Yeah, the first time in the NBA since the 60s. Yeah. Wow, there you go. And Carl nice. Anthony Towns didn't even realize he scored 32 in the um, or 33 in the third quarter. He's like, I scored 33 in the third. I wow. scored 33. In the third. Yeah, right. Oh. <laughs> like, That's like, your game. To the interview, yeah, to the interview, which is kind of to me. Somebody commented this, and I agree. That just shows the love of the sport to athletes that they don't care about that stuff when they're playing. They're just going. They're just zoned in so much that they're just going through the motions. You could tell them they scored eight points in a hockey game after they're like, oh, I did. Or you could tell them they scored 50 in a basketball game. They're like, oh, cool. I didn't even – I was just playing my game and doing yeah, everything right. to make my I team better. Like, yeah, I'm not, and then afterwards you're like, oh, I dropped 50. Like, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, it's like Joe Green said it. Me and Joe Green said it. Um, the One of the, the interviews that he said, and he said, yeah, guys talk about getting in the zone and and things like that. And you know what? That's not really that's not really a thing. You don't ever really get into a zone. You just get to a point where everything is coming together for you on on the playing field where you have to put in the work, you have to put in the time, you have to put in the energy and the effort. And that's when because he said he said that he was only in the zone one time. For one little period of time during a game, he said he was in the zone. One time. We're talking about a guy who's in the Hall of Fame, has four Super Bowl championships. One of the best defensive players of all time. Yes. Ever to play the game. Says he was only in the zone once. I do think it depends on the person, though, because he was such a work ethic hound yeah. from what I've read about him that yeah. you th you're thinking at that point, you're not doing it by a zone. You're doing it based off of all the practice and stuff you had. Exactly. Where even a guy that was such a work ethic hound, Kobe still admitted he would get into a zone. That's where exactly. the Mamba mentality came out of. There, there wouldn't be Mamba mentality if it wasn't for Kobe, due to his work ethic, getting into that zone yep. while playing exactly. and just taking no prisoners with him when he was playing. I mean, the dude shot a foul shot with a torn Achilles. 
I mean, so. yeah, I, I'm with you. <laughs> I agree 100 percent. Joe, thanks very much for joining us. Why don't you tell the folks where we can uh, find you, where we can get all your great articles, especially about the Reading Royals and all the stuff that you're doing for them and all the great coverage you have for the Phantoms and also for the Flyers, from Flyers Nitty Gritty. Where can you get all your stuff, buddy? Yeah, well, Flyers Nitty Gritty, uh, Steel Flyers, of course, uh, on SteelFlyers.com, where you can also catch up Hayden, John, Lance, and all the other great contributors, including Steel. Um, and then also... Um, I'm going to be doing a lot of stuff on Sports Fanatic News for the different moves made. I've been putting out stuff for baseball, hockey, and football, um, and I'll be doing stuff as that hubba bubba passes, like I said to your reef last night. I'll be doing a lot more stuff on the NHL draft and uh, talking about some stuff in terms of baseball, um, who projects to be the top teams going into the season, and that type awesome. of talk once all this crazy <laughs> transaction period is. I mean, you know, for real. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Joe. I'm your co-host for this, the JB and Steel Show. Uh, we are on volume 13, I believe, here. Volume 13. So there you, very, there you go, folks. Check us out. Hit the like and subscribe. Check us out on the web at www.steelflyers.com. You can check me out on Twitter at SteelFlyers52. Thank you all very much for watching. We'll catch you on the next episode of the JB and Steel Show. <laughs>